Mic check, check one, check two. Can you hear me, Dave? Can you hear me, Dave? Yes. Okay. All right. Good morning. Thank you for joining us today to discuss important action the administration is taking to address the ongoing security and humanitarian crisis at our southwest border, publishing a final rule to implement the Flores Settlement Agreement. This year, we have seen an unprecedented flow of family units, primarily from Central America, coming to our southwest border. During the first 10 months of this fiscal year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection apprehended or encountered almost 475,000 families, 90 percent of whom crossed our border unlawfully between ports of entry, three times more than any previous full year record. In the month of May alone, we saw 88,630 members of family units arrive at our border, four times the record month in the last major surge. As I have testified multiple times and as experts throughout this administration, as well as leaders from previous administrations have explained, the driving factor for this crisis is weakness in our legal framework for immigration. Human smugglers advertise and intending migrants know well that even if they cross the border illegally, arriving at our border with a child has meant that they will be released into the United States to wait for court proceedings that could take five years or more. This key gap in our immigration framework comes from a 2015 reinterpretation of the Flores Settlement Agreement, an agreement that is now more than two decades old by a federal district court judge. This reinterpretation, which applied for the first time the requirements of the Flores Settlement to accompanied minors, has generally forced the government to release families into the country after just 20 days, and incentivizing illegal entry, adding to the growing backlog in immigration proceedings, and often delaying immigration proceedings for many years. This single ruling has substantially caused and continued to fuel the current family unit crisis and the unprecedented flow of Central American families and minors illegally crossing our border until today. After nearly two years of work by the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services professionals, consideration of over 100,000 comments from stakeholders and members of the public, and a comprehensive review, the Trump administration has established a new rule to respond to the realities of current immigration flows a rule based in the principle that families should remain together during immigration proceedings. While the Flores Settlement Agreement is operationally outdated and does not respond to the current immigration crisis, it has many important aspects and principles, like the need for special protections for children and high standards for government facilities that were adopted as defining features in this new rule. This is an extensive and detailed rule, but this morning I want to highlight four key elements. First and foremost, the new rule permanently establishes standards of care in custody for children and families. These standards are high. In doing so, the rule fulfills one of the central, original purposes of the 1997 Flores Court Settlement Agreement to ensure appropriate care for all children. A national standard of care ensures that care, of custody, care in custody of children and families is not a policy decision and should not be subject to the ebbs and flows of state and local politics. Instead, all children in the government's care will be universally treated with dignity, respect, and special concern in concert with American values and faithful to the intent of the original settlement. The facilities that we will be using to temporarily house families under this rule are appropriately fundamentally different than the facilities where migrants are processed following apprehension or encounter at the border. They are campus-like settings with appropriate medical, educational, recreational, dining, and private housing facilities. For example, the first family residential center in Berks, Pennsylvania has suites where each family is housed separately. Furniture, bedding, towels, clothing, and toiletries are provided. There's a large community living room that has big screen television, cushioned couches and lounge chairs, a gaming area, and a separate library that contains books, other television sets, video games, and board games. The facility also has an entire wing dedicated to classroom learning where minors at the facility go to school five days a week. Another wing is a medical facility where minors and their parents receive any necessary medical care, including all immunizations required for later admission to U.S. public schools. There are also phone banks to call relatives, consulates, attorneys, or other representatives. In all federal, excuse me, in all family residential centers, three hot meals a day are provided and snacks are available throughout the day. 
All of our three family residential centers offer a variety of indoor and outdoor daily recreation activities for children and adults. Indoor activities offered include a variety of sports, group exercise classes, arts and crafts classes, movie nights, and even seasonal holiday themed activities. Outdoor recreational uh, facilities include soccer fields, volleyball courts, and play structures. The FRCs have video conferencing set up for court hearings and private meeting rooms so that families can meet with their attorneys or representatives. Child care is provided to the parents while they meet with their attorneys or representatives or attend these hearings. Interpreting services are available 24 hours a day via telephone. Attorneys and representatives approved to appear at immigration court hearings are provided access to the residents at various times each week, enabling families to obtain counsel and not have to appear at immigration hearings as pro se respondents. The new rule will ensure that children and families in the care of the government are temporarily housed in facilities that are appropriate for their well-being. Second, the new rule closes the legal loophole that arose from the reinterpretation of Flores, which Congress has refused to do, allowing the federal government to house alien families together in appropriate facilities during fair and expeditious proceedings, as was done by the previous administration in 2014 and 2015. Prior to the 2015 court ruling that restricted our use of the FRCs, immigration proceedings averaged less than 50 days, granting those with meritorious claims prompt relief and permission to stay in the U.S. with appropriate documentation, while swiftly repatriating those with meritless claims who have comprised a substantial majority of the families arriving and being processed. Our goal remains, as in the previous administration, to provide an expeditious immigration result while holding families together which particularly benefits legitimate asylum seekers with meritorious claims. The current system, however, serves those with meritless claims and leaves all migrants in a state of limbo for years. In recent months, the majority of final orders of removal for families who recently arrived at our border have been issued in absentia, over 85 percent. This rule changes that dynamic. The result of holding families together under the previous administration was a dramatic reduction in the flow of unlawful crossings by families. The 2015 court ruling upended that process, and the direct and predictable result has been two family surge crises at the border, first in 2016 and now at unprecedented levels this year. When fully implemented, the new rule will restore the humane and effective procedures employed in 2014 and 2015. Third, by closing this key loophole in Flores, the new rule will restore integrity to our immigration system and eliminate the major pull factor fueling the crisis. As I stated earlier, this, this year has brought record volumes of family units to our southwest border. In the first 10 months of the fiscal year, U.S. Customs and Border Protection has observed a 469 percent increase in the number of family units apprehended between ports of entry from our FY18 numbers. While this year's increase is especially dramatic, family apprehensions have increased at an annual average of 72 percent over the past fiscal year. Fiscal years. In fiscal year 2013, before Flores was reinterpreted, the total number of family units apprehended entering the United States illegally on the southern border was 14,855. Again, by August of this fiscal year, we have already seen almost 475,000 family units apprehended. By eliminating the incentive to make the journey to the United States as a family, the new rule will reduce the unprecedented volume of family units that has strained the already limited resources of our department components and put children throughout the region at risk. The scale of this crisis has required us to ask a tremendous amount of our Border Patrol agents and CBP officers as they have stepped up. This new rule will provide them with well-deserved relief and allow them to rededicate their resources and time towards stopping criminals at the border, the job they signed up to do. And fourth, the new rule will protect children by reducing incentives for adults, including human smugglers, to exploit minors in the dangerous journey to our border, using them to beat the system and be released into the United States. So far this fiscal year, Border Patrol agents have identified approximately 6,000 migrants who have fraudulently presented as members of family units at the border. In response, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement Homeland Security Investigations has conducted two DNA pilot testing programs that have definitively identified dozens of cases in which children had no familiar relation to the adults claiming that. In the first operation, Operation Double Helix 1, 16 out of 84 family units were identified as fraudulent based on negative DNA results. In the second op version of the operation, 79 of our 522 family units tested have been identified as fraudulent based on negative DNA results to date. These egregious examples of migrants posing as family units that ICE has uncovered demonstrates the necessity of this new rule. No child should be a pawn in a scheme to manipulate our immigration system, which is why the new rule eliminates the incentive to exploit children as a free ticket 
or as one gentleman in Guatemala told me, a passport for migration to the United States. This action by the administration is just one part of our overall effort, but it's an essential one that will do a great deal to address the crisis we are facing. To emphasize again, at the heart of this new rule are two core principles, that families should remain together during immigration proceedings and that conditions for care of children must be appropriate. The new rule establishes a high national standard for, for care of children and families in custody, allows the government to keep families together for fair and expeditious immigration proceedings, restores integrity to our immigration system, and eliminates the incentive for children to be used or exploited to enter the United States. The border security and migration challenges we face require a whole-of-government approach, and we look forward to working together, including with our international partners, to continue to address them. Thank you. I look forward to taking your questions. Good morning. Based on this new regulation, how long do you expect families to remain in detention together? How long do you estimate the court proceedings will take? Well, again, we, we've done this before uh, as, as uh, Department of Homeland Security. In 2014 and 2015, under then Secretary Jay Johnson, family residential centers were established and these proceedings were implemented. Uh, during that time period, the average stay was under 50 days for completion of an immigration proceeding. Uh, CDP has released over 130,000 family units since March, um, as, you have, as you all have said, uh, because uh, your systems are overwhelmed. Are you prepared to detain all of these family units starting tomorrow, or will more bed space have to be created? Yeah, we're not going to be detaining every family unit that arrives starting tomorrow. Uh, what Flores, the regulation implementation does, and again, it's not going to be effective for 60 days uh, from publishing in the, in the Federal Register, which is Friday. Uh, but it allows us to, to keep families together through their immigration proceedings. We have three family residential centers, uh, about 3,000 total uh, family uh, beds in, in those centers. Uh, but that's going to allow us to bring families in, finish immigration proceedings as one of a multi-layered strategy. We're also working with Central America. We're working with Mexico to address immigration flows. We have the migrant protection protocols, which can be used to have families waiting in Mexico during their immigration proceedings as well. Uh, so what this will do is substantially increase our ability to end the catch and release uh, challenges that have fueled this crisis for families. Is it, is it, uh, you said that eliminating the incentive for families to make the journey to the U.S. is obviously uh, one of the primary goals here. But is it possible that families considering coming here will not really listen to the Flores rule issue? They will hear words that you just said like campus-like settings, sweet for each family, families will remain together, library, gaming area, three hot meals, soccer fields, and they'll say, wow, that sounds great, let's go. I, I don't think so. In, in our experience, the, the main driver for immigration flows is the, the perception that they'll be successful in being allowed to stay in the United States. If we have a process that gets immigration results and the vast majority are being repatriated in a timely fashion, that's the message that people will see. Five to 7,000 per person, a dangerous journey in the hands of smugglers to the U.S., ultimately not successful within a matter of weeks and months. That, that's going to be what changes the dynamic. That's what happened in 2014. That's, what ha that's what's happened whenever we've been able to effectively implement uh, in immigration consequences for people that don't have meritorious claims. Do you expect to implement this new rule before it's enjoined in the courts? So obviously there will be litigation as, you know, all new immigration rules have faced litigation in, in my career. Uh, so we, we do expect, a, you know, a, a dialogue uh, in the courts. And in fact, uh, this rule contemplates terminating the, the floor settlement agreement. And actually there's a, pr a legal proceeding just to do that uh, coming out of the implementation. So we, we do uh, expect litigation. Uh, we do hope to be able to implement as soon as possible. And just to follow up, uh, what's the capacity of, the, of these facilities that you're talking about? Again, we have approximately 2,500 to 3,000 beds, depending on family configuration. Question back. Um, first of all, thank you for holding the press conference today. Related to your trip to Panama, can you speak to the Washington Post report that you're looking to strike an asylum deal that would allow the U.S. to send extracontinental asylum seekers to Panama? Actually, we've got a much broader uh, agenda for our, our trip to Panama. Uh, we're engaging in a ministerial meeting. We, we do a monthly ministerial with the interior and security ministers from Central America. It started just with the Northern Triangle countries with the U.S. as an observer. Now it's expanded to include Costa Rica and Panama. We're going to have Colombia there. Uh, and we're going to be talking about regional security issues on a broad basis. In terms of our bilateral discussions with Panama, uh, it's a new administration. They were inaugurated last month. 
Uh, my counterpart, the Interior Minister, Minister Moronis, uh, is, is a strong law enforcement background. We've had great initial conversations. We're going to talk about our broad security relationship and building on a strong foundation for partnership information sharing uh, with Panama. Uh, that will include uh, the movement of, of drugs through the region. That will include uh, human smugglers and traffickers and a dialogue about the irregular migration flows. Uh, but there's not going to be any specific agreement negotiated on this trip. So you confirm that specific point, though, that extracontinental asylum seekers would be something under discussion? Well, all these countries are concerned about extracontinental asylum seekers. Uh, the flows come through the entire isthmus of Central America. Uh, the, the smugglers that are bringing them are, are charging 25000 to 50000 per person uh, for these flows. We have seen security risks embedded in these flows. So absolutely, this will be a topic of conversation for all the ministers. Um, um, how can you assure that children will not be held for months and months at a time? I mean, your administration, a lot of concern, your administration separated children from their parents, kids have died for being taken into custody. How can you assure that they will be well cared for and that they won't be detained indefinitely as the judge has Okay, the, the purpose of, a, of holding uh, individuals in administrative custody during immigration proceedings is to get an immigration result as expeditiously as possible uh, and for those that have meritorious claims uh, to have them released and, and for those uh, that do not meet the standards to have them repatriated. Uh, the, the rule also establishes very clear parole and bond procedures for, for release of individuals going through their proceedings uh, for various reasons. So th there's no intent to hold families for a long period of time. In fact, we have the prior experience that shows we were able to average under 50 days. Uh, that, that is the intent for a fair but expeditious immigration proceeding. And that's all right for final order? Correct. Right. If I can just follow up on that. Obviously, the time period in 2015 in which 50 days is dramatically different from the time period now. The backlog has exploded to, I think it's 900,000 new cases. It's an average of two years. What other steps are you taking to ensure that you can get in that 50-day period, given that the backlog has, has actually worsened much more dramatically since then? Sure. Mm -hmm. Just to make an important distinction here, the, det the detained docket, this is the court dockets that immigration judges uh, uh, operate where people are held in immigration custody and ICE custody, those move much more quickly than the multi-year numbers you're hearing for the non-detained docket. Uh, that 900,000 to a million case backlog is on the non-detained docket. The detained docket actually moves for single adults much more rapidly than 50 days. Uh, so we do anticipate being able to keep these cases on track. So clearly, you have judges that are working with detained docket, non-detained docket. There's been a lot of movement. There's been sort of ever-changing requirements for these immigration judges in terms of what they should be prioritizing. Those things are connected. So what, what other steps can you take? Yeah, we work closely with DOJ, the Executive Office for Immigration Review, and, and we're targeting those priority cases that are going to make an impact on this humanitarian and border security crisis. That means those recent border arrivals and the detained docket, as well as migrant protection protocols, will continue to be the focus for timely adjudication. If you take just a couple more questions. Thank you so much. Um, my understanding is there's no plans at, at this time to build more family residential centers that would then be licensed under this agreement. So I'm just wondering if, if that is the case, if you could confirm that. Um, how would this agreement, uh, you know, have teeth, or this, this new rule actually have teeth and actually determine what you're hoping to do? Sure. Just a quick reminder, we did ask Congress for additional uh, family beds uh, in the uh, 2019 budget process and in the supplemental. We did not receive them, uh, so I think that's important to, to recall. Uh, but going back to, to 2014, when we established family residential uh, centers in the first place, uh, the initial housing for families was at uh, a dorm-like setting at the Border Patrol Academy, uh, uh, then under Secretary Johnson. Uh, and really, those initial hearings, getting results and having families repatriated had a significant deterrent effect on the flow. And so by the time the family residential centers were built out, they had enough capacity to manage the ongoing flow. We anticipate a similar reaction uh, when migrants and smugglers understand that a child is no longer that, that free pass or, or quote unquote passport to the U.S. for migration. Secretary, you said there is a high standard to be met for the conditions in these centers. How do you plan on doing that? Do you have funding? Are you going to be hiring a slew of trained people? Uh, that are going to be caring for these children and families? So, so both. We, we do have funding for the family residential centers that, that it currently exist. Uh, they do include significant standards. And again, this is all articulated in this, this multi-hundred page rule. 
Uh, we, we do have contract professionals, medical professionals, mental health professionals, counseling professionals, uh, all going to be on staff at, at these centers uh, and managing and interacting with the families and children. Our last question, sir. When do you expect to publish? Uh, again, it goes to the register today, published Friday uh, officially, and then it's, it's effective 60 days later. All right. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Thank you. Thank you.